you would, uh, take, your, take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter, chapter 16. Uh, just want to, there I am, okay. I uh, just want to thank uh, Pastor Mayfield for allowing me to preach. Um, I'm also, before I read the text, I'm very happy to see uh, Martin here this morning. Uh, me and him work in crawl spaces, so that's the hole that's underneath your house. And so I'm hoping that if I'm preaching and I get myself in a hole, Martin is right on the front row here to pull me out. So I'm very happy and excited about that, to have him here. Um, so let's go to the text I'll be reading from the ESV. Um, Genesis chapter number 16, beginning in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children... She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be then I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power to do to her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called, the na- she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Laharoi, it lies between Kadesh and Bered, and Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. I have been uh, reading through uh, Genesis as uh, about 80% of my Christians friends have at the beginning of the new year, and um, one of the things you come to in this, in this book um, is Abram's and, and Sarah's life and their struggle to have uh, faith in God. Uh, I remember listening uh, a few months back uh, to J. I., part of J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God, and in there he uses an illustration uh, of a balcony overlooking a road. And um, he says that um, there are two ways to view the road. There are those that are on the balcony and um, 
they are out looking at the road and they might look at how the road is paved, whether it's gravel or whether it's asphalt or um, perhaps, the slope of, perhaps the slope of the road. Does it have good drainage, all those things. But then he talks about that there are those that have to navigate the road. They are not in the balcony overlooking it. They are out there in the road and, and their problems are different. They might uh, want to know, how do I get where I'm supposed to go? How don't I go the wrong way? And uh, so here in Genesis, I, I think we come to Abraham's life and Sarah's life and maybe that's some of their questions because Abraham uh, does well in some chapters having the faith to go from the Ur of Chaldees, but yeah, then, then he stops. And he, he does, uh, then, he, then he goes on, but then he goes down to Egypt. And when he goes to Egypt, uh, he doesn't do so well. He's afraid about him getting killed, so he pretty much hands over his wife to the Egyptian king. But then he does well in chapter 15 when he goes and uh, Lot has went uh, the wrong way, went to Sodom. But he has enough courage, he has enough faith, and he goes and rescues uh, his nephew Lot, even though Lot uh, did the wrong way. Um, sadly, on this roller coaster of uh, Abraham's uh, faith life, or Abram's faith life at this point, he is on uh, is on the way down. He's in a dip. But it amazes me in this chapter that we see God's uh, mercy and grace even in that dip. Uh, but before we, we get to really the, the, the bright spot at the end, uh, we'll start at the beginning. Um, we see at the beginning really uh, Sarai's impatience. Uh, it says in verse 2, And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan. Sarah's, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. I don't have a fancy title for this point, but I'll just call it sin. But how do we, uh, how do we, how do, how do we get there? How did she get there? Uh, Abraham... Sarah, they're not the only sinners. You and I are all sinners. And so I kind of see some things that are leading up to this point. And this point in uh, Sarah's life, she's probably uh, about 75 years old. God has given Abraham a uh, promise in chapter 15 um, that he will have offspring through him. And it is assumed through his wife. Um, God did not sanction polygamy. Man kind of sanctioned it as they went along, but that was not God's plan in Genesis 2. So I will just say this. It seems that Sarah gets discontent, she gets impatient, and she starts to blame her circumstances on God. Now I get that God is Sovereign, But I will th say that it's interesting, this passage in Genesis, you hear uh, in other stories, you hear that God sealed up somebody's womb. Well, not, not even, even just in Genesis, but in 1 Samuel, it says that about Hannah. But here we don't necessarily hear mention of that. The narrator, for some reason, I think it's intentionally, he leaves that out. But he's talking about the fact that Sarah comes to this conclusion that God has kept her from bearing children and so she has had this impatience with God and now so that she has this impatience with God she's got to try to figure out how to do things her own way. And may I say many times we get in a situation or I get in a situation and I get, in, I get impatient. We may be wanting to try to do the right, right thing. 
Um, I mean, in one sense, she's trying to help God out, right? Uh, but we, we get in those situations, and may I say it's not right, it's wrong to try to help God out. He doesn't need your help, quite frankly. If you pray and trust in Him and act in how He wants you to do things, He knows how to get you from the situation you're in to the situation where He needs you to be. But just as we're all learning, so Sarai is, is, is she's, she's learning. And Abram is learning too. Uh, the bad part here is that they didn't really learn from history, uh, assuming that they knew about, uh, uh, about the record of the fall, they would have, they would have been able to maybe uh, notice that they were duplicating kind of what happened to Adam and Eve. Right, Eve was somewhat unhappy with her situation. She got tempted. Sarah was somewhat happy with her situation. She was tempted. Wanted to have another plan. Um, and so they came together. They got an, Eve got another plan. Let's grab this fruit. And then Sarah had another plan. Let me take my servant Hagar here. And Eve gave the fruit to, uh, to Adam and Hagar, or uh, sorry, Sarah gave, gives the servant to Abram. And then the man doesn't say, hey, this is wrong, we shouldn't do this. The head of the household doesn't say that, but he goes right along with the plan. So we need to uh, learn from history, but... Moving on, uh, we'll talk, talk a little bit about Hagar. Uh, the first part of the chapter, it's um, not exactly f great to see, essentially, if you will, Abram and Sarai's fall. Not Adam and Eve, but they're continuing on, continuing the same behavior. But in the second part here, um, we see the, what I would call the, the obedience of Hagar. Now, early on, she's not really obedient. Uh, she, when she conceives, uh, when, she, when she finds out she's pregnant, then she kind of looks at her master with uh, Sarah with contempt. And so that brings on a lot of strife and, and Sarai kicks her, uh, doesn't kick her out of the house, but treats her in such a way that she, she, runs, she runs away uh, from, the, from the problem. But perhaps most of us would. I've been in situations where I feel like you just want to get out of the situation. And so she needs help, but thank goodness in verse 7, it says the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. The spring was on the way to Shur. Some commentators say, think that it was on the way to Shur. She was basically trying to go back to Egypt. She was trying to go back home. But this, this angel of the Lord, which can be translated, and I think it is translated better messenger, because sometimes we think angel, we think somebody, uh, this angelic being with, with wings and stuff. But it simply means the messenger of the Lord, founder. So this is the first time that I believe that God himself we, we comes and meets and talks with someone in the form of a human messenger. It's called a, a theopony in the Bible, and it happens many times. In, in uh, chapter 18, it, something similar will happen with three visitors and uh, Abraham. And uh, so here, God finds her and, and gives her some, some kind of difficult instructions. It says, and he said, 
Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Now, if I was Hagar, that's probably the last thing that I would want to do. Here's a woman that has probably been uh, bought by Abram, and then now she's kind of used as this pawn in, in this sex scheme, and now she has been mistreated, uh, but yet the angel of the Lord, or the Lord himself, um, as we'll see in a second, tells her to go back and to submit. And uh, obedience and, and submission, especially today in America, we don't really like that. She wasn't going back and really trying to submit to a, to a perfect uh, a perfect person. You know, I've had, uh, I've had bosses that I really loved and I've had bosses that I did not like, but no doubt in my mind the whole time that unless the boss told me to do something unethical, it was my job to try to submit to my boss in, in that capacity. Elsewhere, the Bible talks about submitting to the government. Perhaps at this time, uh, perhaps who you wanted to get in didn't get in, and you, that, you may find that very hard uh, to submit to the government. But in general, uh, just as Jesus told Peter when he cut off Malchus's ear, uh, the way of the kingdom of God is not to take up arms, it's not to fight back, it's to love our enemies, submit uh, to those that are in authority. And so that's what God tells her to do. And I think the thing to keep in mind is when submitting to authority or obeying God in, in many situations is that you don't know the whole story, but God does know the whole story. I'll, I'll try to illustrate this with uh, something from my life. When I was... 16, turning 17, I worked for my half-brother. He mowed for the Army Corps of Engineers. He was a contractor, and um, we mowed around a dam and a visitor center. It took us about three or four days, and we could have up to 10 men to mow this whole place out. So I was getting ready to go in the Air Force. One of my last days of work, and my, my boss, my half-brother, had instructed me, look, when you go down there, we didn't have cell phone research, uh, service. It was two hours' drive down to R.D. Bailey Dam. So when you go down there, you quit at 4 o'clock. You, do you don't go past 4 o'clock. It's pretty simple instructions. But you know when you get down there and you're mowing and you're looking at the field and you're thinking... I only got about two or three acres left. This will only take me one more hour, and I can be done at five. Well, you might guess that I didn't quit at four that day. I quit at five, 5.30, something like that, and then I drove back. Well, my half-brother had had planned with a member or two of the church a going-away party for me. And when I got back, I found nothing but cold pizza. And the reason why is because I, I thought I knew it all, but somebody above me had given me instructions to obey, and I did not obey them. These, thankfully, Hagar submitted, and she obeyed the instructions. And uh, a third, uh, third point is we see uh, just Hagar's reaction to God here um, in the final verses of this chapter. Verse 11 says, And the angel, I was starting verse 10, The angel of the Lord said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot, 
they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man and his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Ber La Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Barad. And then it talks about that she bore Ishmael. I, I, one of the reasons I love this story in Scripture is because the person who you expect that wouldn't have faith or the, the underprivileged or the person that you would not expect knows God is the one that God reaches out to simply because she looks to Him. Um... It says that she says here, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. You know, we, we know that, that God knows all and God sees all, but many times we, we can forget that. We can forget that whatever situation we're in that God sees and Loves his children. Uh, I think of an illustration in the, in the book of Job. In Job chapter 23, um, Job is there and he's struggling. And all of his friends have come and sat with him for seven days and been quiet. And then they mess up and they start talking. Um, when they talk... They have many theories about why Job is in trouble. And obviously having heard all these theories about how you've sinned and how you've, how you've done wrong by 23, uh, chapter 23, Job's not only discouraged by the death of his family and by the way his wife is acting towards him and his health condition, but he's also distraught, distraught of being accused by his best friends of sinning and getting himself in that position. But um, I, I love uh, what he says. It's in, uh, just flip to Job 23 here real quick. In Job 23, he wants, he essentially, he wants God to answer his friends. But he realized that at this time, God's not going to show up and set everything right at this point. But he says this in verse 8. He says, Behold, I go... He's talking about God here. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And by the way, this is not, uh, this is not the end of the story for Hagar. In chapter 21, she does have a son, he grows up, and then it ends up that in that situation, she's kicked out again because her, her son is, is mocking uh, Isaac, and she's out in the desert, and there God meets her again. And when God meets her, she's out of water, in the desert, not a good place to be, God shows her a well. And when she sees that well, she has hope. 
in thinking about that, I think about the New Testament. There was another woman that met Jesus, or Jesus rather met her at a well. And she was just looking for regular water. And like Hagar, this woman had had a rough time in life. And she had had several husbands. The person she was with was not her husband. But Jesus said, I'll give you living water. And that's the great story of the gospel is that not that man is reaching up to God, but God is reaching down to man. And today, if you're uh, not a Christian, you don't know Jesus as your Savior, God is reaching out to you. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And He's trying to reach out to you. But you have to make a decision of, will I trust in myself like Sarah and Abraham did, or will I cling to Jesus? Will I trust in Him? And by the way, it doesn't stop once you're a believer. Each and every day, we make the decision of, whether I, will I trust God like Agar did and put myself under the hand of God, under the hand of some circumstances I don't like, or will I try to do it my own way like Abram and Sarah did in this chapter? Um, this chapter's encouraged me. I'm glad to have the opportunity to preach. Um, if it's all right, I'll close this in prayer, Pastor. Is that how you want to proceed? Or? Lord, I love you. I thank you for this day. And... Um, God, I just pray that in this church you would use your word in uh, all our lives. We're living in uh, not the darkest part of history, but in a dark part of history where people, people desperately need Jesus and where Christians desperately need to trust and obey you because uh, it makes all the difference. And we do love you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.